Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He is a gold and silver expert. He has interviewed a lot of the top experts in gold and silver for his Arcadia Economics YouTube channel. He is also a Warden School of Business MBA graduate. Very impressive. And he was a professional options trader for a number of years working with investment banks, hedge funds, financial professional before he quit, I believe, shortly after the 2008 financial crisis from our last interview. But he's here today to talk about gold, silver, and his new book, which is just out, looks fantastic, now available on audiobook too on his website, on the uh, Arcadia Economics website, The Big Silver Short, the shocking story about how the Wall Street banks have left the silver market in place for the short squeeze of a lifetime. It features 15 of the world's top silver experts interviewed in the book. Chris Marcus, thank you for joining me. Jason, thanks for the kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to be back on your show and nice to see how your your whole audience and program has grown and honored to be here today. So thanks for having me. Yeah, I could say the same about you. Your YouTube channel is growing nicely. You're getting a lot of the top gold and silver experts on for a while now. So let's talk about that. Now that you have interviewed a lot of the top silver experts over the last couple of years, what don't most people understand about the silver market that you think they should? Well, I don't think most people understand how distorted some of these markets get, how different it is from what we grew up watching the media and and thinking these free markets that we were supposedly sold here in America. Some people say, well, why do you focus on silver all the time? All the markets are manipulated. And I completely agree with that. Silver one was one of the more extreme ones and has just been quite fascinating to me. And perhaps as one nugget that I don't think I know that you know this, but and maybe your listeners probably because I know educate people really effectively. But one of the things I asked most of the people I interviewed in the book was for each ounce of silver, how many paper claims do you think are on it? Nobody gave an answer lower than 500. And I'm guessing a lot of your listeners know of David Morgan, the silver guru. He said 500, but it's probably bigger than that when you factor in the derivatives. So if you ever have some point where people start demanding their metal and you have more than 500 people think they own the same ounce, well, it's really set up something similar to it's the end of uh, the end of It's a Wonderful Life. And, based, and, and now based on the recent data, the two most likely probabilities are that A, that point is either occurring now, or B, if you say that the data is entirely fraudulent, which is probably on some level not entirely inaccurate, Um, But I mean, we're kind of at the point where those are the two alternatives in a levered up inverse Ponzi scheme, if you will, kind of like the the big short, you saw things go down. Here, it's a little different where the silver price, when this uh, plays out, I think is going to go up quite a bit. And we can dig into why today. Now, you're talking about bad data. Is that the commitment of traders data that's released on the COMEX? Well, I mean, I take everything with a grain of salt. I mean, <clears throat> you have Silver Institute and CPM that provide the majority of the statistics. And I would not personally take either of them as gospel. A lot of people say, is metal actually going into SLV? I actually have called the administrators. They say that when new shares are created, that metal is going in. Um, but, you know, it's like, what are you supposed to think when J.P. Morgan's the custodian simultaneous, t- simultaneously being charged with the RICO statute? And in my experience, if you do business with people who are not honest and are not trying to interact with their customers in a way that helps their lives, maybe the metal will be there. But if you try and get it out, they charge exorbitant fees or something. It's really hard for people to know what to do in this current environment in many cases. Not not the easiest thing to unravel. 
We're recording this interview on Tuesday, July 7th, 2020. Gold, gold prices, excuse me, gold prices are at $1,795, just below $1,800. Silver is finally above $18, an ounce at $18.27. Now, you brought up something interesting about taking delivery. I've heard crazy stories about what really happened in 2008. Supposedly, there was a lot of metal, according to the COMEX registered vaults of physical silver, in the um, available for delivery, but the reality was the exact opposite. Um, I actually know someone, Jim Poplava of Financial Sense News Hour. he actually took delivery of a ton of physical silver in 2008 and 9, and he said he had to wait six full months for a yeah. silver that was supposedly, there was plenty of it in the vault. So have you heard similar stories about that? And that's how the paper games, besides the derivatives, that's how the market works with rules changes and people have to, even though there's uh, claims that there's a lot of silver in the vault, that there's not actually a lot of silver in the vault. Well, I mean, it's like saying the SLV has more silver than ever, but people are buying it and it's being deposited. That doesn't mean that it's available. I mean, I guess it's available for sale, but when you think about the average profile of your silver bug, which is generally, despite silver being this great conductor and having a history as money, we're a bunch of hoarders. So, you know, I do, uh, I also do orders for Miles Franklin and it's like I talk to people all the time. The majority of the people are buying big chunks, you know, they've been sitting listening to people like you and me for 10 or even 20 or 30 years and they, they stockpile their silver and I don't think it's the type of people that are going to say like, oh, silver went up to 21. Let me go <laughs> take my haul down to the local We Buy Gold shop. Um, so it's a very skewed demographic. So, yeah, there's silver there. But somebody request, somebody's, at least according to the COMEX data, is uh, up to about 65 million ounces that are being put up for delivery. I assume somebody's taking it. Now, whether that means metal is actually leaving the building, but at least theoretically, if they're putting it up for delivery, that implies that someone is purchasing and saying, I want my metal. And in the span of three days last week, you know, a lot of people were waiting to see, you had record gold deliveries in June. So we were sitting here waiting to see what would happen with silver in July. And you had 65 million ounces from the COMEX but at the same time, you had 32 million ounces added into SLV and the other silver trusts. That means 97 million ounces were demanded in one form or another in three days. That's 10% of the annual, that they only mine, you know, around 900 million ounces a year. And if you're getting 90 million, 97 million demanded in three days, you can see it's not going to take long for... That's why it, it could be, unless the data is fraudulent, I mean, I choose these words very carefully because I understand if you say silver is going to go to $200 tomorrow and then it doesn't happen, but I would, I would think unless the data is fraudulent, you look at these numbers and it, it's some form of a run on the bank is occurring now. Yeah, let's briefly just talk about gold for a second before we go back to silver and supply demand fundamentals for silver, which I'm sure you cover a lot in the book as well. So what seems to have happened based on the articles I've read, the other experts I've talked to with Ronan Manley, who wrote an excellent piece yes. in mid-April about what happened in March on the LBMA and with the Bank of England and HSBC Bank, which is the custodian of GLD, there was a lot of rules changes in March to try to cap the gold price and knock it back down. There was hedge funds that were starting to get very long with leverage, gold futures contracts leveraging up, expecting a higher gold price. The margins were hiked. And then apparently HSBC Bank got some type of a bailout from the Bank of England and Ronan Manley was citing 170 tons of physical gold to try to help knock the price down. So all these games were changed and people ask me, why do, is a gold price not already $2,000 an ounce? And I just point to this because this is similar, Chris, you were around too in 2010 and 11. This is very similar to the types of games, but it doesn't work nearly as long as it did back then. All the different games with margin hikes and stuff. Look, gold is already, after a brief correction, almost at 1800 again. Yeah, I mean, it's like the Enron scheme is on fire. It's almost amazing that it's still standing, and I'm sure your listeners, again, we're recording this on Tuesday. If you pull up the silver or gold charts, 
But in particular, silver, it's 11 years I've been following silver. I've never seen a chart quite like this. We've seen that V shape where the price gets pounded and just drops off a cliff. And then in the last couple of weeks, we've seen it bounce somewhat almost back up in a V shape. Today was just a little different where you saw it grind lower and it's more like a U, which I am not by any means a technical analyst, but just when you sit there and watch these things and certainly knowing that the, you know, the things are decided in paper, Bart Chilton confirmed a lot of that, which I thought was darn well helpful where it's not, he really put a lot of the pieces in place that, you know, we could say with more certainty. So it's not theory, but I mean, here's the guy that was part of the investigation. And uh, if you want, we can talk more about that. But I mean, it's the same thing with gold. And what, what do you expect to happen when the Fed can't, the Fed can't even tell you how much they're going to print. I'm guessing we have some sort of bigger package. Uh, we're uh, we're going to have bigger than unlimited probably before the end of the year. So people aren't morons and they can see what's happening. So it's not surprising that they're piling into gold. Uh, I bring a lot of mining executives onto my show. Whereas two month, two, three months ago when the price is, when silver is down at you know $11.88, some of these guys are like, man, we're not gonna be able to raise money for years. And then it's amazing within a month or two, deals are oversubscribed. Today, I was talking with uh, a mining executive. He, I mean, they're, they're mentioning that institutional money is coming into the equities now. I feel like it's going to be a little tricky to put the tree back into the acorn this time. And it reminds me a lot of what I've read about with the London gold pool. To be clear, I, in my own personal trading, I still plan my finances and trades and life around, okay, I think think i mean it seems like if it happened in the next 10 minutes it would be overdue but okay there there's going to be a lot of political pressure you know the banks i imagine it's like the devil fighting for his life whether it's margin hikes or switching the data or something that we couldn't even imagine now i imagine that's really what to me you're pricing to the downside is how the rules can be changed like on the hunt brothers but i mean in terms of what's happening in the world and the supply and demand of silver, that paints a rather stunning picture. You mentioned the silver investigation with Bart Chilton. Do you think that a lot of that was rigged? Because I know Bart was the one who was championing that, but it seems that everyone else involved with the CFTC was going out of their way to make sure that whether it was the people at GATA were not able to testify or Andrew McGuire wasn't allowed to testify. And then the recording, I was watching this online with audio and video, and then the recording just goes out when Bill Murphy's were trying to read the testimony into the record. It was just a mess, a sham of an investigation. Yeah, I mean, what are you supposed to say when uh, they don't want to talk to Ted Butler, Andrew McGuire gets uninvited, or not technically uninvited, but they said they were, he could come, but he, they weren't going to let him speak. And that was one of the things that stood out to me early on where, I don't know, I just started uh, after the housing bubble collapsed. I was thinking about how that was odd that, you know, almost no one had seen it coming in advance except for anyone who was talking about gold and silver. But then the whole manipulation element and seeing it's hard, like they went out of their way to avoid talking to key witnesses and all the stuff that you just mentioned so I'd say around 2011, I'm not saying that JP Morgan sitting there worried about the fate of the dollar. I'll, my guess is they probably couldn't care less, but I think it's almost like it's the perfect the banks. You know, they're making a fortune if you can move the price around. Jason, as I know you're well aware, if I told you that the price of any asset was for 100% going to move 20 cents at a specific time, you basically have a printing press, right? They'll leverage up that trade. If yeah. they know it's rigged like that, they'll front run it, they'll rig it, yeah. My guess is that you know the banks are happy because they make money doing it. And like you said, certainly there's a lot to see. It's hard to see otherwise how the regulators are not at least looking the other way. I actually emailed Bart in 2011 at uh, Ted Butler. And one of his columns was saying, email all the commissioners. Bart was the only one who wrote back, much like he stated in that interview I did with him. 
And he said, basically, you can reference the things that I, the interviews I've did done where he talked about the manipulation, how he thought it was rigged. But he said it takes three out of five to vote to pass the vote. So essentially, he was saying, wink, wink, you know, my hands are tied. He said that again, what, eight years later when I brought him on for the interview last year, which is part of the book and makes it fascinating that you have this Department of Justice investigation ongoing now where the thing that they're actually getting guilty confessions for, I don't know if that spoofing is really the heart of the issue, although what's interesting is that these price movements we see, that's exactly what Bart Shilton defined as spoofing. So we see the crime that these guys are getting arrested for continue on as the investigation drags on and were it not for uh, speaking with Andrew McGuire, who's part of that process, he seems to be more confident that there is actually something legitimate going on. Um, I know he's closer to that than I am, so I'll defer to him on that one. But I mean, aside from that, at least on the surface of it, you got to be wondering, all right, are these guys noticing? Did you see, uh, you know, can you look at some of these trading records? It's and I think the difference now, and you can hear this from bullion dealers, is that on those days when the price gets pummeled, used to be it would stay down for a while and people would be throwing in the towel and selling versus now, at least I hear from them all the time. They're like, wow, I got on the dip today right before it skyrocketed. And I think people realize what's going on now. Yeah, I agree. I think retail, U.S. retail, a lot of retail investors that have savings are are becoming their own central banker and they're accumulating physical gold and silver. And I think a lot of professional money managers who are allowed to do it are buying gold and silver stocks on dips. So there's clear accumulation in the charts if you take a look at the charts. Now, you talked about the precious metal market manipulation extensively in the last 10 or 15 minutes. Do you agree with James Turk that this is basically a managed retreat? And what I mean by that for listeners who are unfamiliar with me discussing this is where certain price levels are defended for a while and then the miners run out of supply or they just decide they can't cap the prices at certain levels because maybe it destroys the miners and there's no physical supply left for the miners to mine economically a certain price. And that's why we don't have silver at 10 or $12 an ounce or gold at $1,100 or $1,200 an ounce. So do you agree? Agree with uh, James Turk's managed retreat thesis. I think that makes sense, and there are parameters to the game. I mean, if you, I'll bet if they sold enough contracts to drive the Comex price down to twelve bucks tomorrow, I'll bet it's possible. We saw that a couple of months ago, and I mean, could you roll out a COVID headline to and front run that? Do I do I think that kind of scheme is within the parameters of what's going on in the markets. I'm not saying that's exactly what's happening, but do I think that kind of thing is possible? Sure. But if you drive gold or silver down, if, you, if, if they got silver down to $12, I think the amount of people, I'd, I'd have to hire another assistant to handle orders for silver because you would see, and that's, you've seen it. And I'm not, I'm not, making some forecast that's what we just saw the last time it happened and you know and to what you mentioned earlier with fund managers there that's another key difference where uh, i think you know ronnie stoiferle who writes the in gold we trust report and i remember he did an interview last year who was mentioning how he would go to these fund managers and ask them what their allocation to commodities was and it wasn't 10 percent or five percent or one percent it was zero Versus now, and I think I would say this is unofficial, my feeling, uh, but it feels to me almost like in the last month, now you have fund managers saying, oh, what's that? They're like, Bill, what's that? Slip, slip, sliver? No, s silver. Oh, what's that thing that's up 20%? They're not even going to know what it is. Um, although I think there are a lot of smart fund managers that are now getting into the silver equities which is interesting. Uh, I had Rick Rule on the show a couple of days ago, and he talked about how you have gold, then the gold equities, then silver, and the silver equities, which is not to say that it has to go like that because it did it last time, but certainly there is a track record and looks like it's playing out again this time. 
and Jason. Actually, may, may I ask you a question, sir? Okay. <laughs> when gold is crossing 1800 and then 1900 and I think the Fed's guaranteeing it's going to at some point cross 2000. I think that'll be this year, but we'll see. But I mean, what, what are you going to is silver going to be possible to be below $20 when gold's crossing 2000 bucks? Um, I think the average person on the street on Main Street is going to say, well, I can't afford gold. I'm going to start accumulating silver. So they're going to start accumulating silver. They're going to want to get in on it. What most people don't understand, Chris, um, there's something in economics called like a a Geffen good or a Giffen good. I forget the exact pr uh, pronunciation and spelling, but what it basically means is gold and silver. I would add silver in there too with the money monetary component, but mostly just gold is one of those rare goods where when the price goes higher, normally in supply demand, when the price goes higher, demand falls, except with gold. When the price goes up with gold, demand actually increases. So the higher gold goes, and this is why I think the paper price manipulation scheme is done. Because if gold busts through the dam, if gold goes to $1,900, $2,000 an ounce higher, the demand for gold will actually increase. Yeah. I mean, especially now where we have a momentum-based trading environment where it's kind of a buy, buy high, sell low <laughs> mentality baked into the cake. And, you know, once gold, I don't know if they put, did they put gold back on the CNBC ticker yet? Um, I haven't seen, I haven't watched CNBC in the last couple of days, so I can't tell you that. But if, if gold does go over 2000, you're going to see like uh, people with like fake gold chains do TikTok dances. So you're going to see all these millennial traders start to buy these penny gold stocks probably and start to pump those up because that's not because that's not happening yet. I mean, we're, we're on the verge of a historic event. And I think it's there's there's obviously so much in life happening so quickly between Corona and whether we can go out of our houses and all sorts of things that are happening in life. And, you know, it's kind of like people wondered if we would get one day have a Sunday night announcement that would be the same as Nixon removing us from the gold standard. And, and I think it happened and it was just so quickly that people didn't even notice it. Uh, which interestingly enough, uh, the date of that was actually the Ides of March, which uh, is just an interesting, especially given that some of the things you hear that the folks who decide such announcements get into. But um, I mean, it's like then you go to unlimited quantitative easing and I think it's all happened so quickly that it's still sinking in. But now, as the market is catching up and the money is continuing to be printed, it's not hard to figure out that gold might be a good idea. And I mean, when gold crosses 1800, I think that's going to be a big event. And let's pull up. Uh, it got pretty darn close today. And look at that. It shot right up to 1795. I love these gold and silver charts where you see they sit there flat as a rock for a like one or two day stretch and then it's boom up or boom down um which i've in my experience uh and that was part of it i was working on a trading floor this was back in 2011 when i saw what happened that year which is what got me into all this and i'm thinking well gee in my entire career i've never seen a market that acts like this and then Essentially, uh, the you know the last nine years have been trying to figure out: Am I missing something, or, or else? If we saw these metals go to their hot, to gold, its high, uh, silver matching its high in 2011. Really, the only reason they came down, if if natural demand was pushing those prices above fifty dollars in 1900, and the only reason it came down was because a bunch of frat boys on a trading desk hit the sell button. And just figured by the time that ever unravels, it'll be on somebody else's watch, um, which I'm guessing is probably exactly what happened. And, you know, maybe we're at that point now. But that would make th those levels seem like a floor uh, whenever that leverage is removed. And again, it seems it seems like we're getting pretty close to that point if that's not already happening. So Steve Angelo, who I think you're also friends with on July 6th, he put out an article about Proust 
2020 silver production down by one third due to mine lockdowns. Mexico was shut down for a while. There, um, Peru and Mexico are the top two silver mining countries in the world, I believe. So do you think that the silver supply demand fundamentals actually improved from the coronavirus because of how much mine supply has come offline? I mean, I think for people who are long silver, they got to be looking great. Um, pulling up the ETF editions, which at uh, last count, it was all, it's about 300 million ounces have been added into the silver trust in the last year. Now, this is in a, in a market that, according to Silver Institute numbers, was a 100 million ounce deficit last year. So it was about 900 million between mining and scrap and recycling and everything else. Um, and about a billion were consumed if you include investment demand. So I'm sure there's some uh, industrial demand that's gone down with what's happened with COVID last month, but uh, Jeff Clark of goldsilver.com reported as much as 50% of the silver supply at one point was offline. Um, and again, you know, not only did you have 300 million ounces into SLV, Every bullion dealer in any location on the globe that I've talked to had a surge in their numbers, um, March, April, um, and then if you, if, if you have 90 million ounces demanded in three days while the supply is offline, um, makes you wonder. And that that's why it's probably going to go. That and in fact, the the same reason that I kind of played off that title, The Big Short. It just seems so similar where, similar with the mortgages. If you lower interest rates, and we've seen that pattern play out again, you know, you're going to build that excess credit and it's going to seem great while you're lowering interest rates. But Jerome Powell went on 60 Minutes saying, well, now is not the time to undo this or pay the money back. Well, what about the last 10 years when you told us the economy was great? I mean, it's never the time to pay back the money, but when you unravel the leverage, it's pretty predictable what's going to happen, even if the timing is not always so clear. I don't think the money can ever be mathematically paid back. There's the amount of debt total globally is over 250 trillion. It's not mathematically possible to pay it back, especially with what's been happening the last four or five months, how they're just accelerating the amount of uh, deficit spending in the U.S. and the fiscal policy injections and the U.S. going to MMT. But you brought up silver industrial demand. I don't know if you saw the article. I'll put the article, excuse me, I'll put the article below this interview in the information and description section for my listeners. The senior portfolio manager at Sprott Asset Management, Maria Smir Smirnova, wrote an article about consumer trends boding well for silver for long-term silver industrial demand. That article came out on June 17th. So I'll put that article below if listeners want to see how industrial demand long-term, now maybe in the short term, so uh, industrial demand, like you said, is right. But Sprott argues that, um, well, Spr Maria Smirnova from Sprott argues that uh, industrial demand for silver, there's a lot of long-term um, tailwinds. Yeah, I think I've actually met Maria, to be honest. Um, and that was one of the things that I found was interesting in the book, where, again, it was nice to get so many different perspectives from so many people with a deep background in silver, because it was, it, it kind of le left that feeling of like the Harlem Globetrotters against the Washington Generals, where it was just so one-sided, where you know, you look at California is requiring solar panels on all new houses that are built. So solar panels have silver. I mean, that's a whole new chunk that's come into the market. Um, basically anything going green, electronics. Clothes. What's so, that? Uh, they, wo they weave silver into socks and Under Armour and other clothing brands for antimicrobial. I'm I mean, it's like anyone that any scientist that you hear talk about silver and they go on about the million different uses. And again, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe some people think I'm biased. I didn't like wake up with a silver bar in my crib and say, I'm going to go like sell silver to people. Or, I mean, it wasn't like I had some agenda to, to say this. I mean, the book and everything that I've been doing is just because everything I've seen was so stunning and in fact, I would say the book actually was maybe on a subconscious level was a means to see because my trading style from back on my options days where, 
you know, I'd go and see what made sense and then back test it. See like, all right, is there anything I'm missing? You know, similar to we were trained with a poker mentality where you look at the different clues and maybe you're this level of confidence in this situation and you're balancing all those things. And I mean, it was just so fascinating and stunning what was going on. And I, th there was one period, maybe two or three years ago where I started to wonder, maybe I'm missing something because this just keeps dragging on and nothing ever happens. And then fortunately, I think that was actually around the time you and I met and when I started interviewing people and it was one after another, Rick Rule, Ted Butler, Doug Casey. And, you know, it was like right when I was wondering, you know, am I not seeing something here? And everyone I talked to, they say the same thing. They're some of the most successful investors in the world. And what I love about it, though, is that, again, you don't, have, anyone listening, you don't have to take my opinion. You don't have to take Jason's opinion. The stuff is out there in broad daylight. I think we're just often indoctrinated to, you know, nod our heads like Pavlovian dogs in front of Jerome Powell and, you know, whichever other guy they parrot out there. But I mean, if you look into the actions and the track records, um, you can see it for yourself. People probably remember Bernanke saying subprime was contained as it was continuing to melt down. So I'd say uh, people can trust your gut. You know, you can feel it. You can see it. And really, uh, I think there's a lot of effort to get people freaked out. And, you know, I think a lot of people made an intelligent trade back in 2010, 2011, buying gold and silver. I don't think they were wrong. I think they got cheated. And hopefully there will be some uh, reimbursement from one of these investigations. That's something that I'm trying to see if I can coordinate any action about. And, but I mean, more importantly, you know, I can understand the confidence being shaken a little bit. But if you're feeling that, wow, this seems like a coiled spring, um, I'd certainly agree with you. And again, suggest to verify any of these things. But Trust, trust your gut in the end uh, is a good formula for anything in life. So in the book, you talk about the Hunt brothers. Now, the mainstream narrative is that the Hunt brothers were trying to crash the dollar. They caused all these problems in society. What really happened, though, with the Hunt brothers? Were they actually cheated and screwed over? Well, the Hunt brothers sound incredibly similar to Warren Buffett's 1998, I believe, uh, shareholder meeting, where he talked about the reasons why he was buying silver. Um, I guess Warren Buffett didn't talk as much about government inflation, but I don't know if this was just the, the mainstream version portrayed that a bunch of cowboys went out and tried to corner the market. I don't think it's any different than any large entity that buys anything that's undervalued. And also some of the details of the story of how it actually went down, where they stepped on the trading floor and that sent the price out to $50. That was actually years before that. Um, again, Jeff Clark of Gold Silver wrote a great article about that and talked about it in the book as well. So I think they were uh, some people who were very concerned about what they saw out of the government and the spending and seeing that it was going to have to be financed somehow. Um, probably where they got themselves into a little bit of trouble was putting leverage on. I mean, were it not for that, interesting to imagine how things might have played out differently. And certainly, as I was discussing with someone earlier today, if there has ever been a market where I would not recommend using leverage, silver would be it. So I hope folks at home are, you know, obviously do what's right for you. But I would never, I mean, even being an... That's what I like about options. You can back out leverage without having to risk more than you put down. So um, it's a fascinating situation where if you have patience and a good approach that can hedge out any time risk, I mean, it's an incredible investing opportunity. Um, but if you're doing anything that keeps you up at night or you don't want to tell your wife about, then probably putting it on too big. But if you avoid that, um, that was, again, something that I found all these guys that I've talked to say the most money they ever made was when they found something that was really out of line. And if they knew it was out of line and they really were confident in that, the price went lower, they would buy more. And, 
You know, if you think silver at $18 is pretty out of line, not only a third of its 2011 high, third of its 1980 high, while gold is double its 1980 high, approaching its 2011 high, and debt has skyrocketed. Fed balance sheet has skyrocketed. A lot to potentially look forward to, I think. You brought up leverage. I think probably the safest leverage that people can have to higher gold and silver prices are mining stocks and maybe a, a little exposure to some junior mining stocks. But they have to be very, very careful which companies they pick out because there's a lot of problems with a lot of the mining companies. And it, mining in general is just a really difficult business. I think the average retail investor just doesn't understand how difficult mining is compared to so many other businesses in different industries. Yeah, definitely a different risk profile than just owning bullion. I mean, if you get an ounce of silver is going to and throw it in your closet, it's going to be an ounce of silver whether the Comex says it's $18, uh, you know, $10 or $66. Um and and could you repeat your question again there Jason? Sorry, I got a little excited uh with with that last part. Oh, I was just talking about the risk with mining stocks. So the average retail investor, I think, does not understand the amount of risk that a mining company has. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, when getting back to the mining stocks there, I mean, you have maybe they find gold or silver, maybe they don't. Um, so you and you have management teams, you have people involved. If I'd say in my experience, uh, especially, you know, meeting a lot of these different companies, I'd first think if, if there was only one thing you looked at, look at the people running the show. Now, have they done it before? Do they know what they're doing? When you hear them talk, do they sound like someone that you'd want to run something? Uh, so that's a good starting point. And certainly, certainly if you pick some good ones, and perhaps even if you don't pick some good ones, my best guess is that now, again, I, I think strongly that silver at some point is likely to have some sort of quicker ride above 50, maybe even quicker than – it's actually interesting when you think about how quickly it did happen in 2011. Even if you had that, let alone something quicker than that, if that occurred, probably any stock with silver in the name, whether they had silver or a bunch of rocks in their project, probably is going to soar. With that said, over time, you know, picking good companies, you know, and maybe have some long shots where you say, I pick 10 junior miners, I hope to hit one or two of them. But if you hit one or two of them and you've structured in an amount that's appropriate, then you can still come out ahead. So obviously, you want to match the risks with, you know, what's appropriate for you. But yeah, some of these mining stocks, you're seeing it in the gold miners. I mean, a lot of these companies are making a lot of money now. So if gold continues to rise, which seems like is a good chance to happen, then you know a lot of these companies get leverage on it, and that's why their prices are going up a lot. So I want to ask you about the gold to silver ratio. So the gold to silver ratio got to a record high. It was a, right around 126 ounces of silver for one ounce of gold in early March. And now we're down to, right, it's a little above 98 at 98.37. It's dropping a little bit. I have the live screen here on goldprice.org. So what do you think if the silver bull market and your thesis plays out with a lot of the details that you talk about in the book, what type of gold to silver ratio do you think that we could potentially see? Hmm. Well, definitely a lot lower. And I'd say it's already lower than the 90s you mentioned there, because if you buy actually a gold eagle and a silver eagle, uh, I haven't updated that ratio in a while, but even a month or two ago, it was in the 70s. And something I found interesting is that in terms of the above ground stockpiles of the metal, so we're talking about metal in investment grade, bar, 1,000 ounce bar form, so SLV, GLD, COMEX, stuff like that. There's actually less above ground silver. Silver is more scarce in investment grade form above ground than gold right now. I think there's about five to six billion ounces of gold. And most estimates say somewhere in the two to three, two to four range for silver. 
if the ratio in the Earth's crust is about nine to one, but the ratio above ground has been, you know, gone below one to one, you could make the argument that it should go lower than nine to one, which to be clear is different than saying it is going to go lower than nine to one. Although at the same time, perhaps making it somewhat possible to do that is when you look at the inflows into the metal, they're priced at, you know, uh, if you use COMEX, 90s, 8-ish to 1 or whatever it is right now. But, I mean, it's like the amount people are spending, I wouldn't say is 1 to 1, uh, but I mean, it's, you know, like 5 to 1 or 10 to 1. I mean, the people are putting a lot of money into silver, a very small market um, where you're seeing not a lot of silver... I'm curious to, to know where the silver is coming from right now to meet this demand while the mines are shut down. And again, everything that I can see is that it sure is testing the break point. Well, I, I think we're going to find out soon where that break point is, but there's there's no one in the world that I've been able to find who seems to be able to explain how the price goes down at times where you see demand surging and supply falling um except for the obvious explanation it's traded in paper and you know the point isn't to sit there and whine about manipulation i mean i don't know i think you know it creates a great opportunity and for me i feel blessed that now i'm able to uh have a business where i can just study this market that's so incredibly fascinating so by all means i'm not trying to convince anybody to do anything but everything that i've been able to find in the last 11 years just continues to support the same conclusion and i think it will be spectacular whenever it's resolved i'm not going to put a number on it today or at least i'm going to try not to but my gut tells me that whenever this thing unravels and all the pressure that's behind it i think jason even people like you and i will when by the time it's all said and done we'll be like wow, I never expected that. You know, I, I think it will just, I'm not trying to, you know, sound wild here, but it's like, I, th I think it'll play out like what you would expect it to play out when you have 501 plus leverage. Yeah, the gold to silver ratio in a bull market in the past, it's gone to, I had David McElvinney on recently and he said 30 to 40 to one and his family has been in the precious metal business for decades. His dad was actually the guy who helped get gold legalized again for American citizens to buy it. Yeah, I mean, even if it got down to 30 or 40 to one with, you know, let alone if gold moves further, I mean, I don't know, I guess that uh, if I'm thinking of my gorilla math roughly i'm I assume that would more than double the price of silver which would be interesting because a you know if you have some of those silver miners especially if they have a cost of production around 15 bucks you know even the move up to 18 dollars makes a world of difference to these silver miners as i know you talk about a lot jason I mean, some of these miners similar to gold, where it's like you get silver twenty or twenty-five dollars, let alone fifty or more. You know, that's going to be some good news. And it's something you mentioned earlier in our call today, where again, I'm not a technical analyst, although I think there are things that I pay attention to, and especially you know, similar to the things that Bart mentioned about how prices move around those big numbers and you know knowing the way that a lot of people look at technical analysis and that bart confirmed that the banks were gaming people who were looking at some of these charts i just wonder if there's something to be said about once silver gets above 20. saw in 2016 i crossed that briefly I've heard some people suggest that certain bank derivatives get triggered between the twenty to twenty-five dollar range. I've not been able to confirm that. So um, when you think about, I mean, all the, the, I mean, these banks are losing now on these short positions they've had, and you're seeing some of them throw in the towel. I mean, this is the stuff that we talked about years ago when it's like, well, you know, it set up one day to be a problem, but. You know, maybe one day when, you know, banks are like taking a loss and they're like, geez, screw this. I'm throwing in the towel before I get my whole bank blown up. I mean, now we're seeing that happen. 
Um, and, and I don't know listener, how many more warning signs we'll have before it goes. And for our listeners who are not familiar with what you just said, you're referencing how I think bullion banks like what Scotia Makata are closing down their precious metal trading desks, right? Yeah, they're they're closing down uh, HSBC. They got blown out. Uh, took a two hundred million dollar loss. Day the paper gold market broke on March 24th, CIBC lost money. And another interesting thing that happened recently was last week, JP Morgan basically has acquired in their COMEX account 160 million ounces that began coincidentally right after the price dropped from $50 in 2011. So factor that in as you will. Um, you know, they just put up for delivery 30 they, they spent nine years acquiring 160 million ounces and then last week they put 30 million up for delivery um why they did that uh, i don't know that you know anyone <laughs> yeah i don't know they're gonna tell me about it just yet i wondered if it could be some connection to what's going on with the department of justice i'm just speculating on that i don't know but a lot of things happening just wonder how many more warning signs there will be. So, Chris, I want to thank you so much for your time today. If my listeners want to read your book, buy your book, listen to the audiobook, how do they do so? Well, it's a pleasure. Thanks again for having me, Jason. It's great to catch up with you. And folks, if they want to find out more, can go to ArcadiaEconomics.com. Big banner right across the top for the book. Um, or if you just want you know, more uh, content or understand what's going on in silver, why it's happening. Um, there's plenty of stuff there too. And uh, it's the most darn fascinating thing I ever expected to find in my career. And we cover it on a nightly basis and help people be as prepared as possible for when it finally goes down. Excellent. Well, I hope your book does well. Well, I sure appreciate that. And again, thanks so much for having me on the show again.